Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library. I'm very happy to host today our Knauss Fellows presentation. A few logistics first. You are coming into this muted, and the only ability you have to ask questions or make comments is through the question slash chat panel. So please, after each uh, presentation is given, place your questions in the question and chat panel, and we will get to as many as possible in the time frame. Um, if you have any audio or visual issues, I recommend trying to log out and logging back in to solve those. If those don't solve it, or if you um, are having some kind of other issues, please uh, chat me or email library.seminars at noaa.gov and I will try and help troubleshoot those for you. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Christine Zincane, who is going to explain today's format. Thank you, Katie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a C. Grant Knauss Fellow and I'm on the Lunch and Learn Committee. Uh, and I'll just quickly go over what we're doing today. So the format is a little different than usual. And we're gonna do a modified Pecha Kucha presentation format, which Pecha Kucha means chit chat in, China, in Japanese, sorry. Um, and what it means is that you mainly use images and they're um, advancing every 20 seconds. And you have a sem seven minute talk that is revolving around like telling a story and less of the usual format that we're following. So we have five different Knaus fellows telling us a story today. And I wanna go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Lauren. Uh, Lauren is a Knaus fellow with NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology. She earned her master's degree in December, 2019 from Louisiana State University. Her research primarily focused on assessing the status and trends within Louisiana's freshwater commercial fisheries. And Lauren is also a two times AmeriCorps al alumni uh, with specialized training in shell sorry, shellfish aqu aquaculture. I always have trouble with these words. <laughs> uh, land conservation and management and youth education. And I want to hand it over to Lauren. Thanks, Anne uh, and Katie, for that introduction. Um, I will get started now um, talking about some of my master's research. Um, so. If you've ever tried getting information from a fisherman, you'll likely know that it's not an easy task. Many tend to be secretive and suspicious and unwilling to give too much information away. Now picture rural Louisiana with over 300 docks throughout 12 river basins and fewer than 1,000 freshwater commercial fishermen. There's no centralized location for these fishermen to aggregate. It's easy for them to remain anonymous with little interaction from state managers or graduate students looking to ask them questions. But this was my job as a graduate student, find as many commercial fishermen as I could and get them to have a conversation with me about their livelihood. As a young woman from New England, an outsider, I knew this would be a challenge. So why freshwater commercial fishermen in Louisiana? Well, my master's project for LSU and Louisiana Sea Grant was to characterize this often overlooked industry and to understand strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats with the end goal of creating resources to boost the declining industry. And what better way to get this information than from the source itself, the fishermen? So I developed a, a survey to deliver to fishermen in person, but I quickly ran into a challenge. How do I find them? So my plan of action was strategic. First, I met with state inland fisheries managers from each river basin. I asked for their knowledge about local fishermen in their region, and they helped me as best as they could, giving me information about where I might find fishermen, but many were at a loss themselves. In one case, an inland fisheries manager had me follow him in my truck he knew where to find an active commercial fisherman and was willing to bring me there. As I'm following him to what I will assume I was assumed will be a dock, we pull into the driveway of someone's home. The fisheries manager gets out of his truck and I must have looked confused because he told me that this was the home of a fisherman and he's probably out back cleaning his catch from earlier that day. 
Hearing our voices, the fisherman comes around front, clearly surprised and suspicious to see a state agent in his driveway. So here I am in rural central Louisiana at a fisherman's house, unannounced, trying to ask him questions about his fishing activity. It was not the most successful visit, and so I decided to change my MO from then on. After some consulting, I decided the easiest way to find active commercial fishermen was to target the places where they sell their catch, fish houses. Through word of mouth and with some help from state agents, I drove around Louisiana to find rural hidden buildings down long gravel roads. Approaching with a smile and an LSU hat on, I'd introduce myself and explain why I was there. I approached over 12 different fish houses around the state, doing my best to appear intelligent yet non-threatening. This was an iterative process where I visited multiple fish houses multiple times to make my name and face familiar to both the employees and the fishermen coming to drop off their catch. After befriending many of the fish house owners, I then would ask if I could come back for a full day to intercept their clients and interview them. I of course was met with mixed results, understandably, as some did not really want me bothering their clients. But nine fish houses were accommodating. Most just let me stand outside in the Louisiana heat with my clipboard and they'd check in on me once in a while to make sure I was doing okay. Sometimes they invited me in for some lunch and some air conditioning, which I definitely appreciated. Now that I had access to the fishermen, my next task was to actually get the data from them, interview them, ask them questions. Many had seen my face and recognized me as I approached them, but I was still an unusual sight at those fish houses, so they were pretty intrigued. I would wait until they finished unloading their catch, and then I would approach them as they were leaving with their money. This way, they were under no time constraint and were generally in a good mood. And as I introduced myself to them, I would explain my project, how I was trying to better understand their long forgotten industry in Louisiana, and could they help me by answering some questions. I explained that they would remain anonymous and their answers would be used to ultimately help them. Many were interested in what I was doing and almost 100% of the fishermen I approached agreed to answer some or all of my questions. Many wanted to know more about my project and how the results would help them. In some cases, I had to pitch my project to them and describe why I was doing this and how it would help them. Uh, suspicious of giving away too much information, many were, were skeptical. And in some cases, I needed other fishermen to vouch for me. A key to success, I learned, was to find a fisherman that everyone knows. Once he and I chatted, the next time I visited fish houses, all other fishermen seemed to have at least a vague idea of who I was or what I was doing, and they were more likely to answer my questions. From then on, my conversations with these folks ranged from question and answer in its simplest form, to drawn out conversations about the history of freshwater commercial fishing in Louisiana, including many complaints about the status quo, specifically the declining price per pound of their catch over the years. And after nine months and 37 fish house visits, I ended my project with 34 successful surveys. More importantly, I ended with new acquaintances, a deepened understanding of Louisiana's fishing traditions, and some new Cajun words in my vocabulary. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and, and offer to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, if you do have questions, this is the time. We have three minutes of answering questions after each of these presentations. So if you do have a question for Lauren, please place those in the question panel now. If we don't have any questions in the next uh, 30 seconds or so, we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you.
We do have one question for you, Lauren. Um, the question is, are there any other states with prominent commercial fisheries that your project could benefit? That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I found that this project was pretty unique, um, but there are some other inland states along the Mississippi River that do have some uh, freshwater commercial fisheries and, and in the Great Lakes area as well. So I think ultimately um, my project could be used to, to help uh, with those fisheries also. Excellent. Uh, another question just came in. Um, Lauren, about how much time did you spend driving to all the fish houses? <laughs> uh, in total, I don't even know, but each fish house was probably around an hour, at least an hour away from where I was based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So on some days I would drive up to three or so hours to visit a fish house. And, and um, yeah, it was a lot of a lot of time that took into this going into this project. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, another question. Um, were you surprised with any fishing methods or types of fish being caught? Um, it was it was all a little it was all a little unique to me. Um, I just wasn't super familiar with freshwater commercial fishing before I began this project. Um, but what was interesting to me, you know, a lot of fishermen use hoop nets, which is a, a specific type of gear, but uh, many of them would would use them vertically in the water instead of horizontally, which is how they're typically used. And so that was a unique a unique finding that that I found. Excellent. Um, and let's, uh, here's one last question before we move on to our next speaker. What are the next steps in this research? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the information that I found uh, is, you know, back with Sea Grant, Louisiana Sea Grant, and as part of a program there called Louisiana Fisheries Forward, uh, they're working to create resources, outreach and educational resources for this industry to help with best best practices to kind of boost this industry and hopefully get them uh, back on the map a little bit. Excellent. Um, I think there are a few more questions, but I think we should move on to the next speaker. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so the next speaker is Rachel. Um, Rachel is a Canals Fellow in the NOAA Fisheries Office of Protected Resources as an Acting Communication Specialist. She's also completing her Master's in Ecology at Utah State University, where her thesis focuses on how to best restore native wetland plants in the Intermountain West with climate change threats and competition from aggressive invasive species. Thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction. I'm Rachel Hager. I'm a Canals Fellow through the University of Southern California Sea Grant and an Inland Canals Fellow from Utah. And I'm excited for you to join me today as we take a trip out west to Utah. Let's go on a road trip. In January of this year, I drove from Logan, Utah to Silver Spring, Maryland to start my Canals Fellowship. I'm a Canals Fellow from a landlocked state with very little water. So it's a little ironic that I ended up in an Ocean Policy Fellowship. Welcome to Utah. The indigenous lands of the Ute, Navajo, Paiute, Goshute, and Shoshone tribes. In 1847, Brigham Young and his fellow Church of Latter-day Saints followers arrived in present-day Salt Lake City Valley and proclaimed the land the state of Deseret. Mormons quickly realized that the land had very little water and began to build a system of canals to conserve the water for agricultural purposes. These early agricultural canals forever changed how water flowed in the West. Mormons took the same agricultural practices that worked in the Midwest and applied them to present day Utah. But Utah is not the Midwest. Utah is very, very dry. On average, Utah receives 17 inches of rain every year, compared to over 40 inches in Missouri, where the Mormons originated. Oh. Utah is the nation's third driest state. Here are the most recent statistics from the last 20 years from the National Integrated Drought Information System. The darker the red, the more severe the drought. And in the black box, you can see currently 90% of the state of Utah is in a moderate or worse drought. Most of Utah's water comes from melting mountain snowpack. 
Snowpack water is valuable because it melts slowly in the spring and summer and can be stored in reservoirs across the state to be used to water fields, wash your clothes, and water livestock. And it's not just humans that rely on melting snowpack in Utah, it's wildlife too. For example, over seven and a half million migratory birds visit the Great Salt Lake and its surrounding wetlands every year. The Great Salt Lake and its surrounding wetlands are a major stopover on both the Pacific and Central flyways. The Great Salt Lake is the largest natural lake west of the Mississippi and the largest salt lake in the Western Hemisphere. The Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake, meaning water comes in, but only leaves via evaporation. So the lake itself is hypersaline. In fact, parts of the Great Salt Lake are 10 times saltier than the ocean. Migratory birds use all parts of the Great Salt Lake and its surrounding wetlands, including over 2.5 million eared grebes, over half of the North American population. Up to 20,000 breeding white pelicans live on Gunnison Island, and about half a million phalaropes migrate to the Great Salt Lake every year. This is the largest staging concentration in the world, representing a third of the world population. But the Great Salt Lake is shrinking. Because it relies on melting snowpack, the Great Salt Lake does increase and decrease during, during the year and between years. But overall, the Great Salt Lake has lost more than half of its surface area since the 1980s, as you can see here in these two aerial images from 1985 and 2010. Part of the shrinking Great Salt Lake is climate change. Over the past decades, Utah has seen decreasing snowfall, earlier spring warming, and more rain on snow events, all of which means less of the greatest snow on Earth. But climate change is not the only driver. It's people. This data is from 2010, but honestly, the numbers have not changed much. Utahns use a lot of water, up to two to three times as much as other states. Plus, Utah's population is on track to double by 2050 or before. Currently, three million people live in Utah, or about the same number of people who live in the city of Chicago. Now imagine the city of Chicago doubling in the next 30 years. The infrastructure simply cannot handle that type of influx. And that's part of the problem Utah is dealing with. Utah's water cannot sustain its current growth. Utah is one of the fastest growing states with one of the highest water consumption rates and it's also one of the driest states. And the numbers just don't add up. Utah cannot continue down its current path with its current water availability unless we take water from some very powerful people in Utah. 82% of Utah's water goes to agriculture. Farmers and ranchers hold a lot of water power in Utah. So much so that cities have been buying water from ranchers to create new residential water districts. Farmers in Utah have made progress in making their water more efficient, but overall the process is still very inefficient. For example, many farms and ranches in Utah still use flood irrigation as pictured here, which is a massive waste of water. All of this means more and more water is being diverted before it reaches the Great Salt Lake through canals. This water is used and then very little is returned to the canal which means very little returns to the river, which then drains into the Great Salt Lake. So how do we keep Utah's Great Salt Lake and its surrounding wetlands wet? Well, it all starts with changing attitudes. To a lot of people in Utah, the Great Salt Lake is just a salty, smelly lake on the side of Interstate 15. But that's not true. When I fly into Salt Lake City, I see a view like this, and I see a majestic landscape. The water that reaches the Great Salt Lake and its wetlands are not, is not wasted water. The ecosystems of the Great Salt Lake need water, and it has value for wildlife and for humans. One unique idea is to give the Great Salt Lake a water right, just like the cities and ranches in Utah have a right to their water. Water laws in Utah are complicated, and even if I had the whole hour to explain water law in Utah, I would still barely scratch the surface. There is currently a grassroots campaign to give the Great Salt Lake a right to a certain amount of water every month, 
to guarantee that water reaches the lake. Ultimately, we need to find a way to protect the Great Salt Lake. If we don't, multiple global bird populations will collapse without secure breeding, feeding, and resting grounds, like these white pelicans. I did my grad school research in the Great Salt Lake wetlands, working hand in hand with state, federal, and tribal managers to restore and conserve these wonderful ecosystems. And I fell in love with the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake and its wetlands is a unique place and they need a unique solution. So let's do something for the birds. Thank you for adventuring in Utah with me this afternoon and I'm happy to answer any questions now. All right, we do have a question for you, Rachel. Is there a reasonable way around the doctrine of prior appropriation? So prior appropriation is a complicated, Utah, a complicated issue in the West and there are talks to redo water law in the West, um, but there's not currently a way around it. Um, prior appropriation means sort of first in, the first to arrive means the first and right to the water. And that's where a lot of these issues start is that the first people came and they got the right to the water decades and decades ago. And so now it's hard to create a new water right in Utah. Um, there are attempts to try and restructure that, but there has been no secure change. Excellent. Uh, we have another question and a compliment. Great presentation. What is the primary use of the agricultural land using up watering, water? Are these products slash food that the rest of America uses and eats? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of them are ranches where there is cattle and sheep grazing um, and a lot of the land for agricultural use. Um, there's a lot of corn, there's a lot of canola, um, there's a lot of sort of hay and grazing, um, soybeans. Those are the main ones that come to mind. Oh, alfalfa. Alfalfa is a big one too and that's a very big water user. And one last question, um, the, this person asks, water abundance is, clear, is clearly an issue then. Being a terminal lake influenced by agriculture, how is the water quality of the Great Salt Lake? So the water quality has definitely improved in recent years. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot better since there have been uh, increased restrictions on the input of the water that's gone into the lake from the three main rivers that flow into it. Um, the northern arm of the Great Salt Lake is cut off from the rest of the lake because of a railroad. And that northern arm of the Great Salt Lake uh, has some pretty poor water quality. Um, but I would say the rest of the lake is, is pretty good. Excellent. Um, well, there are some more questions, but uh, we will send those questions uh, to you after the presentation. Um, I guess we're ready now for our next speaker. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so our next speaker is Connor Fagan. He's a Knauss Fellow placed as a Science, Communications and Policy Analyst with the Marine Mammal Commission. He graduated from Louisiana State University Law School in May 2019. Connor worked as a law and policy clerk for Louisiana Sea Grant for two years and at Sea Grant and throughout law school he fo has focused on marine and coastal protections under the law, uh, community outreach on disaster preparedness and stakeholder and congressional engagement. I am, thank you. Uh, for that introduction. Uh, like Lauren and, and Rachel, I'm uh, going to be talking about some potentially sticky sticky issues. Water in the West and fishing in Louisiana are, are both uh, in the news quite a lot. Um, and being from Louisiana myself, I'm intimately familiar with uh, talking to suspicious fishermen. Um, so like Lauren, my, my story is a little, a little different about some other maybe equally suspicious stakeholders. Uh, uh, ranchers in uh, in response to the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. So my presentation is on from whales to wolves management lessons from protecting controversial keystone species. Oh. 
So a very basic primer of trophic cas cascades. What is a trophic cascade? Essentially an ecological interaction Oreo uh, that sometimes has more than one filling. Uh, with a minimum of three feeding levels, a uh, trophic cascade typically uh, describes a, how a predator impacts prey ecology uh, through influencing the density and or behavior of prey. Uh, and in this relationship, predators indirectly benefit and increase the abundance of their prey's prey. Uh, and th in this case, the, the primary members of this cascade would be wolves, uh, ungulates in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and uh, riparian plants. So why wolves? Uh, and how do we pull management lessons from uh, this trophic cascade and overall the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone? Um, one, because they're controversial. The wolves, uh, the e original EIS received over 160,000 comments, uh, public comments, which was the most that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service had ever received at the time. Uh, wolves have the potential for both positive and negative cascading effects. Um, and the debate continues. There's a current debate in Colorado and there's current interest as well. Uh, just last week, there was an article in uh, Nat Geo. So starting the story of the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction from traps to pups. Um, in 1926, wolves were eliminated from Yellowstone National Park because wolves historically preyed on domestic stocks and they were viewed as damaging to the park. Uh, active hunting of the species was discontinued in the 1960s and some wolves were seen uh, during that time in the park. In response to this historic extirpation of uh, the gray wolf um, in, in North America in general, they were uh, one of the original species listed in 19, uh, 1974 as endangered. Um, as you can see here, President Nixon uh, discussing the value of our endangered species uh, to the outdoors and to the public. And they were, so they were one of the original species given ESA protections, uh, which means they are threatened in all or most of their critical range. So in a long time from 1974 to 1987, when NPS and the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed reintroduction in 1987. Uh, this initial proposal for an experimental population of wolves in Yellowstone was prompted because scientists believed that wolves would not drastically reduce potential prey populations in the area, nor would they have major effects on predator competitors or livestock. In 1991, uh, in this timeline, Congress appropriates uh, for a wolf recovery EIS. Uh, this EIS would allow flexible management, allowing for the killing or harassment under ESA Section 10 under certain conditions, including if uh, wolves are threatening game or if wild populations of deer, elk, and other large game uh, were to be severely affected by wolf predation. Um, this, interestingly, this management plan encouraged comp compensation to landowners who suffer losses to wolves. So in 1994, the Secretary of Interior uh, finally signs the final EIS. After years of political and scientific buildup, Secretary Babbitt signed the final EIS to re reintroduce the wolves. Uh, this included different alternatives of which uh, Interior eventually decided to establish a special state-managed wolf population. I'm going to pause here for a second and talk about the politically and societally rife um, issues that surrounded the wolves. So something we're, uh, I'm familiar with from Louisiana, um, you have to engage all the stakeholders and you have to really have a tight strategy. Um, so with the wolves, there was a lot of resistance from ranchers, in particular on the eve of um, when the wolves were being shipped to Yellowstone, there was a last minute loss, lawsuit to stop the, uh, stop the project from going forward. Um, it, was, it was stayed at the time and eventually dismissed in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, but that's just an example of the, the type of things faced by this project. So in 1995 to 1996, 31 gray wolves were brought from Canada to Yellowstone. Uh, and you can see these are the wolves being released into the pen. And that's actually the truck that uh, many of the wolves were shipped in on. In 1997, 10 more wolves were brought from uh, Northwest Montana uh, and relocated to Yellowstone. This is wolf number seven in a shipping container. 
So there are two basic stages, caged and uncaged. Caged, they were trying to encourage the population to bond, form packs, and eventually be ready for the wild outside of their one acre pens. Um, and this was a landmark day. Uh, when they were actually became uncaged out of the protection of the one acre pens in the park, this uh, this started an entire new chapter for the wolves. And at this slide, uh, you can see the growth of the pack. That's Yellowstone Lake in the middle there. You can see the range of the packs from 1999 to 2018. This is another example of what was faced by the wolves. When the wolves go outside of Yellowstone National Park, they face hunting and um, other risks, including being hit by cars out, outside of the bounds of the national park. And that depends, uh, depending on where we were um, in, in their protections, which were chipped away at from when they were established in 1995 to now, uh, to hunting and other risks. <clears throat> So an ongoing issue, wolves preying on livestock, as I mentioned. Um, however, they did prey on livestock less than expected uh, in the original EIS. Uh, going through the timeline of wolf, wolf management, uh, eventually it was uh, wolf management so it was switched uh, to the states in Idaho and Montana, but still kept in Wyoming. And then this is really, gets really complicated after a while, the timeline. So you basically had a decade of listing, delisting and lawsuits. And this is one lesson that we can that we can take uh, from the greater Yellowstone wolves. Um, conservation lessons from this would be, think critically and broadly about the parameters of approaches to conservation. Um, we were reestablishing wolves in states where they are now popular and where state legislatures could chip away at federal regs. We need to think about how regulatory regimes function. Uh, for instance, with right whales, Sometimes we just need more data on where the whales are at a given time. Um, we could merge infrastructure permitting with surveying efforts. We need to think broadly about how we approach conservation man management. We need to lean on our foresight, communication, and negotiation skills. And finally, uh, this is uh, me at the Rose Creek Pen in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone, uh, about maybe 200 yards from one of the original pens. and um, this is one of my scopes set up in Yellowstone when I uh, worked in outdoor education in uh, the Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton National Park. Um, that, that's all I've got today. I'm open to any questions. Okay. Waiting for some questions. Great. Okay, we've had about 30 seconds gone in the question answer period. If anyone has a question, now is the moment to put it in. Awesome, we see some questions. Lisa, do you want to read those off? Let me find it first, I'm sorry. Can you um, go ahead and read those, Katie? I'm sorry. No problem. First question, what are some other comparisons with marine mammals? For sure. Um, I would think, I would broadly, I, th I think about these as uh, wide ranging species in general. So marine mammals travel around the world. Uh, wolves obviously can't walk on water, but they are both wide ranging species with uh, immense effects that we, you know, don't can't completely understand so that I would I would that's how I would compare them and then in terms of management there's all kinds of management issues with the uh, wide ranging nature of those two species great next question how did you transition from studying wolves to studying whales I was actually reverse um, and it was directly connected to uh, law so I have a 
uh, background in the Endangered Species Act, uh, as well as Marine Mammal Protection Act from my time at Louisiana Sea Grant uh, during law school. Uh, and I also, you know, I studied in the field wolves in, uh, out, out in the, the Tetons and Yellowstone. Um, and then through this fellowship uh, and working at the Marine Mammal Commission, transitioned pretty directly uh, to whales. Great, and I'm gonna squeeze in one last question. What are some field practices you use to track the trophic cascade of the wolves? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I was not in the field tr tracking the impacts of, you know, that cascade from ungulates to, you know, willow, for example. But one tactic they do use is, in the Yellowstone National Park, is uh, walling off uh, riparian areas to see what the, to mimic the effect of wolves on that riparian area to exclude elk and other species. Um, so that's one tactic among many. Okay, thank you. And that is the end of our uh, three minute questions and we have to move on to our next speaker. Hey, thanks Connor. Uh, I definitely learned a lot about wolves today. Um, our next speaker is Tiffany Atkins. Tiffany earned her master's in environmental and natural resources from the Ohio State University as an NSF graduate research fellow. Her research background is in fish physiology, behavior and ecology with a focus on the impacts of human-induced environmental stressors on the mating, coloration, and swimming performance of an African chiclid fish. Prior to starting the Knauss Fellowship, she managed the Swarovski Water School USA program at the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, where she taught fourth and to 10th grade students about the water quality and water science. All right, thanks so much for that, Anne. Okay, so today um, I am going to talk to everyone about some of the underlying themes that were the basis for my master's research. So humans are dra drastically altering the planet, and in doing so, we're exerting pressures on wildlife. Our actions affect animal habitat by changing and even removing it. When faced with human-induced environmental stressors, animals have three main options. They can move, they can adapt or they can perish. When recognizing a hazard, our first line of defense is our senses. Usually when we think about senses, we think about them in terms of humans, how we see, how we hear, how we taste. But if we expand our thinking past human senses, we might visualize senses more like this instead. Humans have created many sensory obstacles for animals to overcome. For example, we've made the world much noisier than normal. In some cases, that has drowned out bird song that's critical for communication. There's evidence that some birds in urban areas have actually altered the pitch of their songs to hear each other. But we don't always know how animals are going to cope when they sense environmental changes. With fish, we have five main senses to consider. Hearing, olfaction, lateral line, which is kind of like touch, vision and taste. Today we're going to focus on vision and how altered visual environments can affect fish. Activities such as deforestation and wetland drainage have caused increased runoff of sediments and nutrients into aquatic systems, leading to elevated levels of turbidity or the concentration of particles in the water column. When turbidity levels are elevated above normal, it can be harmful for aquatic animals. Turbidity can take on different forms. So here you can see satellite imagery of Lake Erie under two different conditions. On the left, there's been a, a large storm event and sediment has turned up from the bottom of the lake. And on the right, there's been a large cyanobacterial bloom. Both cause increased turbidity, but with one looking more like chocolate milk and the other one looking more like pea soup. Turbidity can have direct effects on fish by impacting organs and physiological processes. For example, turbidity can clog gills and cause abrasions, and it can also cause a stress response, which can lead to reduced growth and fecundity, and can also affect fish metabolism by reducing their available energy stores. Turbidity can also indirectly affect fish, and it can do so by causing shifts in lower trophic levels. Turbidity has been found to cause changes in algal, zooplankton, and macroinvertebrate communities, 
due to decreased light or increased siltation. These shifts can affect food availability for fish and lead to shifts in food consumption. Another way that turbidity can indirectly affect fish is by altering their visual environment. Not all fish depend on visual cues, but for those that do, turbidity can cause changes to foraging, predator-prey interactions, and even reproductive behavior. So this is Pseudocrenolabris multicolor victoriae, which is an African cichlid species that relies on visual cues for mating. Males tend to be larger and have more red and yellow coloration, and females tend to be smaller and more gray in coloration. In this case, we have the male displaying a signal with the female as the receiver, and the water makes up their visual environment. When light enters the water, it's scattered and absorbed, and in clear water, it actually shifts to short wavelength light, creating more of a blue environment. But when turbidity is elevated above normal, not only does it reduce the overall intensity of light, but when the particles are red like the tropical soils of East Africa, it can cause light to shift to long wavelength light, creating a more yellow or red environment, which can alter how visual signals are perceived. Colorful sexual signals often include yellow and red pigments, also known as carotenoids. Many animals that use visual signals for sexual selection have been found to prefer more saturated color displays. But unfortunately, fish are unable to synthesize carotenoids, so they depend completely on their diets for their carotenoid supply. Different food sources determine the concentration of carotenoids a fish consumes. Plants and algae have higher carotenoid concentrations than invertebrate and larval fish. Consuming more carotenoids can allow fish to display more saturated coloration, so resource avail availability can be critical for reproductive success. Reduced light and turbid systems can often lead to less available plant and algae resources. We've even found pea multicolor from clear conditions with a higher percentage of algae in their diets, and that also display more saturated red and yellow coloration than fish in turbid conditions. African cichlid fish are a great textbook example of adaptive radiation. They adapted across numerous different into numerous different species and across many different niches in the African Great Lakes. Components of these niches can include their diet, the geographic location and the geographic location of their habitat, including their vertical location in the water column. Since increased turbidity reduces the depth to which light can penetrate the water column, this could lead to a situation where different species actually end up cohabitating the same depth together that they might not typically, which could lead to hybridization, especially under altered visual environments if fish can't detect mating signals well. Species diversity is key for healthy functioning ecosystems. Every single species, no matter the size, plays a unique and important role on our planet. It's critical to safeguard these species to the best of our, avail our abilities. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, just one node in a complicated web, just the indirect effects of one environmental stressor. In nature, animals are exposed to several stressors at once, and those stressors can have compounding effects. It's critical to start making changes to human activities to minimize the impact on wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, if you have any questions for Tiffany, please go ahead and enter them in the question box now. We will wait for a few seconds to, to get some questions answered about your Tiffany's presentation. Okay, I see our first question. Uh, Tiffany, what is one thing humans can do every day to mitigate their effects on the environment? So this is something that I worked really closely with the students that I taught in Illinois um, when I was doing environmental education. 
And there are so many things that we can do at home. And one of them just being cautious of the ways that we use water. Um, so for instance, um, you know, our storm drains on our roads don't go to a water treatment plant. Um, they go usually straight into a river or, um, or a local water body. And so, um, you know, washing our cars in our driveways can, um, in, can contribute to pollution um, in our waterways. So can um, changing our oil and like dumping our oil in our, in our driveways. Um, and then also making sure that we do have safeguards in our yards. Um, so, you know, making sure that we don't have just like a plain dirt um, yard, planting plants and things that can help with buffering runoff. Great, we have one longer question. Uh, does increased turbidity in the Great African Rift Lakes lead to hybridization of species as they cohabitate a niche? Or does it lead to fish within the same species mating with one another, but fitness decreases as um, female chicklids cannot visually recognize males' fitness differences because of the murky water? Yeah, so I there is some research done by Seehausen um, and a, n a number of other researchers who found that um, eutrophication of Lake Victoria actually coincided with a lack of species diversity and increased hybridization in some parts of the lake. Um, and so that can also be attributed to a number of other reasons in the lake, such as the um, the introduction of the Nile perch, which also made species diversity decrease in, in Lake Victoria. Um, but there is some evidence that part of that is also due to increased eutrophication and increased turbidity. Um, but there is also some other research out there that shows that in these turbid systems, um, males will often relax their signals and not have quite as um, true signals in these turbid systems because there's also a little, I didn't go into this, um, but it also can, uh, carotenoids also help with antioxidation and wound healing and are really important for other physiological processes. So there's also some speculation that those carotenoids will actually get moved to other um, processes in their bodies instead of displaying. And so, yes, there is also this line of theory that it could also decrease fitness of, of fish in these types of conditions within one species. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We've run out of our three minutes, so we are moving on to our last speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, our last speaker is Amanda Dwyer. Uh, Amanda received her PhD in Ecology, Evolution and Marine Biology last year from Northeastern University. Her research focused on the role zooplankton can play in coral recovery from bleaching. She is currently a Knauss Fellow in the NOAA Marine Debris Program. And during grad school, Amanda worked with high school girls to promote awareness in their coastal community of the importance of decreasing litter to prevent marine debris. Thanks, Anne, and thanks everyone um, for staying on and um, listening to this presentation. I'm excited to share with you today some of the stories I found while conducting my PhD research on the coral reefs in Bocas del Toro, Panama. I'm going to share some of the good things I found, some of the not so good things, and some of the more surprising things I saw while working on these reefs. So first, I'll give a quick refresher um, for those of you who may not be as familiar about the threats that our, face, our coral reefs are facing. There's quite a variety of stressors from nutrient runoff, overfishing, ocean acidification, and disease. But my research really focused on the critical stressor of increasing water temperature, which can lead to bleaching events. So during a bleaching event, the algal symbionts living in the coral tissue that normally provide nutrients and energy to the coral are expelled. So at this point, the coral is not dead, but in order to survive, it must find an alternative source to make up for that lost nutrients and energy. And there's a variety of, reco of recovery mechanisms for corals to recover from bleaching events, including increasing heterotrophy, which is what my research focused on. 
So zooplankton are a common part of the coral diet. However, zooplankton communities on coral reefs are poorly understood. And so more information is needed to better understand how they can be a resource uh, for corals who increase their feeding to recover from bleaching. Addition, in addition to this environmental variability and understanding it, it's important to recognize that different coral species will have different susceptibility to bleaching events, and not all species can use the same recovery mechanisms. Additionally, even individuals of the same coral species can show different susceptibility to bleaching and have a different ability to recover from the same bleaching event. So I wanna first share with you one of the most surprising findings I learned working on these reefs in Bocas, which is the extreme exposure to high temperatures that these reefs have seen and been exposed to over the past two decades. So this graph is showing the total number of days each month from 2005 to 2015, where water temperatures were 30 degrees Celsius or higher which would indicate there's thermal stress and you could expect to see coral bleaching. So when you look at this graph, you can see that there's frequent exposure to two to four weeks of multiple months out of multiple years. And we especially see this increase during the month of October. So when I returned to Bocas in January of 2016, the site I was planning to run my experiment on was essentially a graveyard. The only coral I could find in any large abundance was the Orbicella species. And there's an example of this Orbicella colony pictured here. This coral then continued to surprise me as many individuals survived heat stress exposure to 35 degrees Celsius in the lab, which is extremely surprising. And these photos, these photos show you some of my results where some individuals did die as would be expected, while others only showed a moderate or even no visible bleaching response. And since I wasn't able to get a stress response from enough of these corals, that meant I was not able to run my experiment focused on heterotrophy as a recovery mechanism for this Orbicella coral. So next, I tried a new approach, looking at heterotrophy as a recovery mechanism by studying zooplankton communities available to corals on two different reefs. I chose a nearshore reef within a, the, this lagoonal area pictured here, and an offshore reef just outside of the lagoon exposed to open ocean dynamics. And it's important to note that corals on this offshore site are known to be healthier, both in terms of lower bleaching susceptibility as well as faster recovery from bleaching. It's also important to note that zooplankton are patchy, meaning they can be extremely variable across both space and time. So to account for this, I sampled my coral reefs during each phase of the lunar cycle within a single month, then zooplankton communities are known to be influenced by the different lunar phases. To collect my samples, I used scuba to swim with a plankton net directly above the corals to ensure that I was sampling the zooplankton communities that would be directly available to these corals. I then brought my samples back to the lab and analyzed them under a microscope to identify both the overall abundance of zooplankton, so the number of individuals, as well as the, the diversity found, meaning the number of different taxa, as well as the number of individuals within each taxa making up the unique communities. And what I found overall was that zooplankton communities on the near shore site had significantly lower abundance and diversity compared to the zooplankton communities on the offshore reef. And so this was interesting, noting that the lower coral health patterns observed in the nearshore reef compared to the offshore reef. So this led to my next question, to determine if nearshore corals had more zooplankton available to them, would they show an increase in recovery from bleaching events? And to answer this question, I ran an experiment where I measured various physiological parameters of the coral, including metrics for both the symbiont of the coral host itself and I created 3D models of my corals to calculate the surface area of living tissue to standardize these measurements. So for this experiment, I collected corals from my nearshore site, let them acclimate, heat stress them, and once I had a visible bleaching response, I returned them to the reef for five weeks recovery in either an ambient feeding treatment or an enhanced feeding treatment. And this enhanced feeding treatment was created by an underwater light that would not induce photosynthesis, but it would attract zooplankton to create that enhanced feeding opportunity. 
And overall, after five weeks of recovery, all stressed corals, regardless of food availability, had recovered from bleaching, showing again the strong resiliency of corals in Bogus del Toro. I did again have surprising results that the corals in the non-stress enhanced bed treatment showed an increase in symbionts compared to both heat stress treatments, which could indicate that in addition to being a recovery mechanism from bleaching for some corals, increased heterotrophy prior to a bleaching event could help corals be less susceptible to bleaching. So I hope that today, what you can take away is that while corals are experiencing severe stress, stress, stress and threats, there are a lot of surprising and hopeful findings about recovery from bleaching events in Bocas del Toro coral reefs, despite their continued exposure to heat stress events. And with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Amanda. We have three minutes on your question and answer period. And if you do have a question, please pop that into the question panel. Okay, we have our first question. What is it about heterotrophy that helps corals recover? That's a great question. So when a coral is bleached, the main problem is that it's not getting um, the nutrients in the way it normally does from the algae living inside its tissue. But um, most corals, even when they are healthy, are usually feeding on zooplankton at night. So it's important to remember that corals are an animal that have tentacles that can reach out and grab water in the, or grab plankton and other food in the water column. And so they can, only certain corals have been shown to do this, but they can just increase the amount they're feeding to supplement the energy lost uh, when they're not able to get that, those resources from the algal symbionts. Great, thank you. Our next question, how were you able to differentiate between damage of coral colonies due to temperature and pressure from rec recreational divers and snorkelers, especially in the inshore areas? That's a great question. Um, so one thing that is um, that can be different is there's not a lot of damage of the broken coral that can be seen um, from damage of scuba divers. Um, it can be really difficult to determine what is the exact cause of bleached corals because it's not always temperature stress. However, um, when we do see these large heat stress events, um, it is um, common to understand that that the heat is at least a driving factor related to these bleaching, even if it is um, affected by multiple stressors. Great, thank you. I am not seeing any more questions. So if you do have a question, uh, pop that in the next 30 seconds and we'll try and get to it. Um, if there is not any questions, we do have a few minutes before the end of the hour, and I do want to say that we are recording all of the questions, so if we didn't get to your question earlier, um, we will be passing those on to the presenters who can answer you offline um, after the event. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, Anne, would you like to follow up with anything? For our speakers? Um, I just wanted to say thanks everyone for stepping up and uh, bearing with me with this new format. I know it's not not easy to uh, do a seven minute very fast storytelling uh, talk so I was really impressed with all of your stories and they were really great and uh, yeah thank you all. Awesome okay well we did record this uh, so if any of you uh, listening missed a section or would like to review it or pass it on to a colleague, the library uh, is going to be uh, uploading this to our YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com backslash Noah Central Library. Um, or you can also find it on the library's seminars homepage, which you can find on the library's homepage. Um, and with that, I'm going to give you all back a very precious minute of your day. Thank you for joining us and I hope you all have a lovely Thursday.